Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak with Tolbert Nianswa, a senior research associate at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Mr. Nianswa was serving as an assistant minister of health in Liberia when President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf asked him to lead the nation's response to the Ebola epidemic. Under his leadership, Liberia overcame many obstacles to control the spread of the disease. We speak about the lessons of Liberia's control of the Ebola epidemic for our current pandemic with coronavirus. Let's listen. Thank you, Mr. Nianswa, for joining me. Now, you led the response to the Ebola epidemic in Liberia. Can you explain the situation before you took over that response? Thank you, Josh, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's a critical time in the world. Similar thing happened in Liberia. Coordination was a challenge. We didn't have the incident management system that was organized in August of 2014. The outbreak started in March of 2014. Things got out of control. The population was agitating, fear, desperation, people dying in the streets. We didn't have the treatment unit, no testing capacity. The entire thing was chaotic. And so at that point, your phone rang, and it was the president of Liberia. And what did she ask you to do? Now, the president wanted to see the response of the outbreak separated from the health system and that incident management system was set up. And so the incident management system was giving the command and control to lead the outbreak with technical people, epidemiologists, case managers, contact tracers, to lead a technical response separated from the political response that was happening. And so um, how did you organize that response uh, in Liberia? And just this is where it is it is critical right now why we're not working with the tremendous people that the United States is having. I as the incident manager, how to work with CDC colleagues who are going to Liberia, WHO colleagues who are going to Liberia to put the epi surveillance team together. That's people who were tracing the contacts people who were investigating disease, the laboratory system, and organized an incident management system as a tool. So when you look at the response to the coronavirus right now, say in the United States, where I know you're, you're living now, um, do you see similarities to the situation before um, the incident management system was set up in Liberia? Definitely. The U.S. response is ineffective so far. It needs to be restructured and reorganized get ahead of the curve. That's the only way we'll get ahead of the curve. This is what we did in Liberia. Right now, there's an exponential increase in the disease. What we need to do is to test people, trace their contacts. 100% of the contacts should be traced, put people in isolation. But what I hear in the U.S. right now is just organizing hospital beds, ventilators. Those are the things that people are calling for testing. Those are important but you have to prevent the disease so that you don't have that boom and exponential increase that we have in Liberia. Now, one of the interesting things is that people wonder how you could do so much contact tracing, even in the United States, but you were able to do it in Liberia. How did you go and develop the capacity to trace so many contacts in the middle of a, you know epidemic where almost everyone there would think that they might die if they got the disease. I mean, Ebola is so much more deadly for each person who gets it. And so, but, but nonetheless, you were able to go from a small public health response to a huge public health response. How did you do that? And this is where this, the system here is sophisticated. So contact tracing for me to be easy. In Liberia, we don't have alleys between houses. Those guys who were doing the contact tracing, there is no house number, there is no street number, there is no line phones. 
in the home. So we have to train people that are described as uh, shoe foot epidemiologists, feet epidemiologists to go from village to village, from town to town, to trace thousands of contacts. How many people did you have to train to do that? Well, we had to train thousands of people because we did distribute the uh, leadership where I decentralized the response from community level to county level to national level IMS system. And so the IMS system were decentralized and were lowered to top approach, even in Monrovia, where we have 1.5 million population living at the time. I had to make sure that every zone, Monrovia was divided into 22 zones to do the contact tracing. In the United States, where you have cell phones, you have technology, you have houses are connected, you have telephone system, contact tracing should be very, very much easier. And let me give you what I think the U.S. needs to do in contact tracing. There are households here. If there's a case in a household in the United States, we should make sure that we know the number of people that live in a household and their contacts. And what we need to do, Jers, is to put in thermometers in those households for people who are contacts to test their temperatures and, re and report that to a center where we know the contacts. What I see right now on the screen of television screen just is people are monitoring the deaths and the number of cases. You don't see how many contacts are generated from those deaths and number of cases. Interesting. So what you're saying is we should not only be tracing the contacts, but we should know how those contacts are doing. That's how you get ahead of the outbreak because each person that is developing symptoms you will want to isolate them from the rest of the population and get them to treatment. And then you follow up the number of contacts for 14 days. That's what we did. And you must get the last case before the outbreak and come out of control. As it is, it is still increasing until we know who are contacts with the cases. Got it. So part of what you're saying is, number one, you got to pay attention to preventing cases. And you do that by isolating uh, patients and, and quarantining their contacts. So that's, that's number one. You got to prevent the case. But number two, to do that well, you have to um, have a whole system in place. That should be a whole system. Our brain respond like this, none of the intervention goes alone. There's a whole chain of intervention. Someone is sick, finding the contacts, testing the sick people, putting them into isolation, and then the cycle of contact tracing begins. So contacts, contacts, testing, testing, isolation, isolation, that's how you get ahead of the curve and begin to bend the curve. And you, you did that in Liberia, where you, sometimes you don't even have numbers on the streets, and the numbers on the houses, really. Absolutely. No numbers on the houses. Villages, vehicles don't get there. You have to walk hours wow. to get to a case. And so, um, and you had to train thousands of people yes. to be able to do that. Yes. Now, what about the question that some people, if you tell them, they need to stay at home, but they don't have the resources to stay at home. They, maybe they don't have food. How did you help people stay in quarantine safely? This is where psychosocial support comes in. We had an entire pillar, the psychosocial support pillar. One, a confirmed case was detected in a home. We sent food there. We sent the community was also giving support to the family. And family and community engagement and support were very, very much critical for this. And the, the cities, the, the, the states, the county in the United States have to give support to those people who are affected. For years, it's easy because a lot of people can afford. Back home, we have to distribute food to villages and carry food to households. So you have to, you to literally bring food door to door yes. in order to keep, to keep people safe in quarantine. And so you're saying one of the roles here for cities is for the people who need help to give them help so that they can stay by themselves safely. That's exactly. They have to stay home for the 14 days and then you trace the contact. So the next time I see it on the television screen here and to the tax force is to see number of cases, number of contacts, how many of the contacts were traced, at least 100% of an, a contact from an individual should be traced. When I was leading the incident management system, when the epidemiology team report to me, I want to see whether 100% of the contacts were traced to us. I see. And what happened if you got and they said, we only found 90% of the contacts, what would you say? 
the next day the team have to go back. My epi surveillance team that were dealing with contact tracing had to report to me the next day that they saw all of the contacts and their well-being of the contact. That's how you stop the outbreak. I see. And did you have problems with people who refused to stay home that you had to order them to stay home or anything like that? There were the public health law kicks in. There were homes that were declared infected and we got the state police involved, the Ministry of Justice involved to enforce quarantine at that stage. And so here yeah, you work in collaboration and the incident management system is not only medical people, but law enforcement comes in when it is necessary. Only when it's necessary. Right, when it's necessary. But more or less when the people, when the population got to know about the disease that the government was not only doing it for raising resources from the international community, then the community engagement came in and social mobilization was great at a grassroots level. So eventually you saw a lot of participation without having to use right. uh, the, the law. And, and let, me, let me make something very clear. Political leadership, there is not, no substitute for political leadership in an outbreak response. But the political leadership have to support the technical people to get the job done. And this is what President Selly did in Liberia. We had a latitude as incident manager to lead the incident management team. And she was not coming on radio every day when only when it was necessary to do that. We, the technicians, were speaking to the public and telling them how to take care of themselves. The message was number one. The response was number one. Coordination was number one. And you don't see the missed messages that I see in the United States right now. The states say one thing, cities say another thing, federal government say another thing. It must be driving you crazy to watch this happen here. It really, really drives me crazy. And this is where we need to come in to give the kind of advice leading the biggest outbreak in human history, which the Ebola response in West Africa, that I had to lead based on the number of cases. And when Liberia got to zero, we have to move to several and we are getting to bring West Africa under control. Let me ask you this last question. First of all, thank you for walking us through that. Um, do you believe that Liberia may be better prepared for coronavirus because of your experience with Liberia or with Ebola? Do you think that that may be, um, you know, the, the capability of responding with this kind of contact tracing and, and all these different things may be still there in Liberia that will help? Or, or what are your concerns about Liberia and other countries in West Africa? Uh, Ten times more prepared than pre-Ebola for Liberia. We lived pre Ebola, during Ebola and after Ebola. And so what I saw was a health system that did not even have a surveillance system prepared. Then Ebola came in, we learned about our mistakes and got it right and get to, the, to halt the outbreak in West Africa and establish a national public health institute with all of the mechanisms for testing for Ebola, for contact tracing, for epidemiologist and all of that. So the system is being used right now for Corona. My fear, uh, since you asked just, my major fear is if the outbreak, because this is the disease we're dealing with, coronavirus, not like Ebola, where you have to physically touch, this is a respiratory disease with droplets. So if more people get affected, where will those people be isolated? That's my major concern right now in Liberia and the number of testing. A lot of African countries, are not reporting the cases because they don't have the capacity to test with the number of tests that we can do here. So it's still, still a challenge there. Maybe some of the response skills are uh, stronger in Liberia, but you are lacking other things. And obviously the healthcare system is probably not as, not as developed as in some other countries. So you, you really, it's really important to keep the number of sick patients down. Right, definitely. Well, uh, this is uh, extremely, extremely useful. I hope a lot of people listen to uh, what it took to address Ebola in Liberia. And I um, hope that your phone starts ringing all the time for people asking for advice here in the United States and around the world. It's happening. And I appreciate that people are asking for advice. Uh, there are a lot of media institutions coming and then giving what to do. But basically, uh, just with the experience, I think the U.S. need to reorganize the response. I work with very, very talented people. The Americans that I work with in West Africa are very great. The U.S. CDC, 
the U.S. public health system, the U.S. Army, the dark USAID team, these guys are great. Well, you know the people here in the United States who know how to do this. Very well. They know it, but coordination is a challenge. And, and what you're saying is put them in charge. Exactly. Okay. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been great. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.